this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore a PDP 1134A vintage computer. So far in this series, which as you can probably tell from the title is now getting quite long, uh, I've been going through and repairing uh, numerous faults and got on to trying to boot from floppy drive after dealing with a lot of CPU faults, uh, backplane faults and other board errors. And uh, initially it looked like the floppy drive was kind of working. I could uh, read single density disks. I couldn't read double density disks so I already knew there was a fault somewhere. Uh, and then after a short time it uh, stopped working completely and I couldn't read uh, disks at all. And um, what would happen if I tried to read a disk using a, a normal uh, boot process to try and boot from a floppy drive? The process would seem to start, the uh, drive would start clunking away and it appeared to read the first part of the first sector, but then the uh, PDP would hang and if I tried to um, halt the PDP I'd get a bus error, so it was uh, obviously stuck part way through a bus cycle. And um, I started looking at this, I had intended to put the entire repair on uh, video but the series is getting quite long. If it's the sort of thing you want to see in future, then leave a comment, but I thought I'd shortcut this a little bit. It's still not working. I'm hoping by the end of this video we'll have the floppy drive at least functional. Um, so what I've been doing is going through trying to figure out where the fault lies. And to do that, I wrote a series of test programs. I showed these in the previous video. And um, there's one of these for each of the uh, main functions for the floppy drive system. The floppy drive system being the uh, RX211 controller card. That's the one you can just see the bottom of uh, here. It's on some risers. And the floppy drive CPU interface and drives themselves. And uh, each of the uh, main functions for this, such as fill buffer, empty buffer, read sector, write sector, that sort of thing, I've written a separate test program for. Very uh, brief program just to exercise that particular part of the system. The RX02 uses a hard-coded uh, state machine so although there are ROMs in there there's no real CPU it just uses the ROMs as uh, complex logic devices. Uh, I then turn this into a format I can send through the remote terminal into the PDP RAM and then I can run the programs from there. You can't really run them remotely, uh, it wouldn't work, you don't really have direct access to the CPU, you only have access through the, um, the interface, the uh, uh, emulator, the terminal emulator. Um, so you have to run these from the um, PDP CPU and in addition there are some fairly stringent uh, time constraints for some of the operations. Although you can run these manually up to a certain point, um, if you want to do proper testing once you've established that it's working up to a, a certain degree then you do need to run the programs locally. So although I won't be showing it in this video I started working my way through these programs. I started with the simple ones that I showed in the previous video of trying to exercise the uh, read sector and write sector for the RX02 and they just kept coming back with a fault. They'd go through the process but it'd always result in a fault being generated. Eventually I traced this um, fault of the error being generated in response to read sector and write sector to several faults on the RX02 controller CPU board. There were three or four faults on there that all seemed to have occurred at the same time. Now I think one was a device failure which was the original fault and then the rest probably I uh, calls through um, mechanical means handling the board and I'll come back to what um, those faults were in a little while um, but essentially what was happening was uh, when it tried to read or write a sector it wasn't properly uh, counting addresses and there are two RAM chips in the um, interface on the RX02 this is the RX02 interface not the PDP interface and uh, there are two uh, RAM chips and they weren't being properly addressed. There's a counter that um, increments addresses as it's reading or writing, and it wasn't properly counting, and it turned out to be a failed uh, buffer chip. So I've got that somewhere. So 7404, I get a lot of these failing on various machines. Uh, so I replaced that, and uh, it still wouldn't work. It was doing not exactly the same thing, but pretty much the same thing. 
And what that turned out to be, and this is where I was uh, talking about things that I've probably caused, is on most of the old boards, in fact on most of the cameras you can see the board. So you're not going to be able to see too much, but this is the board in question, and the problem was with several of the wires. And if you're not familiar with uh, PCB terminology, the wires are just these uh, pads that serve only one purpose, which is to take the uh, conductor through the board to another layer. Now, 99% of the wires on these boards are filled with solder, and obviously that's done as part of the uh, manufacturing process. And it is quite important it's done on these um, PDP boards because they use such small annular rings on the pads. And um, about 1% of the wires on this board have not been solder filled. And what I found was there was corrosion in some of the holes and the wires weren't conducting through the board. So I had about three or four open circuits. Um, I got around it by cleaning the hole, putting some uh, pins through and soldering from both sides. Um, but I think this may have been um, caused by me handling the board. It's a long thin board and it flexes uh, when you uh, move it and chances are that flexing has fractured some of the vines. It's not supposed to do that, it should be able to handle that, but I think an old board like this with some corrosion and um, it uh, caused a few problems. Now when I found the first one um, I made a point of flexing the board intentionally I don't want it just randomly failing over the next uh, few hours of use. Uh, and then um, I went through, found all the broken tracks, uh, broken wires, and uh, repaired them. Now once I'd done that, it passed the um, read sector and write sector functions. So it was then working as far as I could tell with this board. However, the other functions such as uh, fill buffer and empty buffer were still causing the PDP to lock up and I then get a bus error. So I'll demonstrate that and you can see where I am at the moment. Apologies for all the noise. As ever, I need to have the fans running to prevent the boards from cooking themselves. Um, so I now have the first test program loaded that I want to look at. We already know that the read sector and write sector tests pass. So I believe that the fault is now in the interface board, the RX211 and it seems to be getting stuck through a bus cycle. So we'll just demonstrate this. I've got the fill buffer um, test program loaded into memory and all it does is it tries to read data from the uh, memory card at address 3000 and it tries to load that into the um, buffer chips on the RX02. It uses DMA to do that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but if I try and run this program, so if I set the start address for the program and try and run this, firstly you heard the drive respond, although it's not actually using the drive for this particular test, it still resets it. But notice that again the blue trace which is connected to the error output line of the RX02 has gone high, so we've got an error, and uh, the run light is still on on the um, console and it shouldn't be, it should have got to the end of the test and stopped. If I now try and uh, halt the uh, PDP I get a bus error so it's obviously stuck part way through a bus cycle and the only way to get out of this is to go through the uh, maintenance um, firmware to kill it and then to reinitialize the PDP and it does the same thing every time so clearly there's something wrong with this and um, on top of this, if we look at the data in the um, buffer, so if we try and do a uh, fill buffer followed by a read buffer, uh, data is not being transferred, so it's not getting that far. So next thing to do, how you go about testing this is entirely up to you, but the next approach I take when I get something like this is to break out the logic analyzer and we'll start looking at um, the actual bus cycle because that's where we're getting the uh, problem at the end of the test. So if you're not familiar with the way that the PDP uses the Unibus to transfer data, it, it kind of varies depending on whether the CPU is the one that's kind of driving and controlling that transfer, or if it's one of the peripheral cards. Now in this case, because the interface, the RX211 interface uses DMA, it transfers data directly from itself 
and the data comes from the buffer chips on the RX02 and it transfers it directly through the Unibus to the memory card and it does not involve or directly involve the CPU. However, it just can't ignore everything else on the Unibus and use the bus as and when it wants to. It has to get permission to use the Unibus to transfer the data. So what it does is it asks for permission from the PDP main CPU to use the Unibus. And it does that by lowering the NPR line, the non-processor request line. It then has to wait for a response from the processor and the processor will effectively respond saying yes, fine, go ahead. Uh, but again, the timing is fairly important here that um, it doesn't halt the um, PDP processor as such. The transfer takes place uh, at a certain part of the normal PDP bus cycle. So it's kind of, uh, it's done alongside the normal operation of the PDP. It doesn't bring the entire thing to a standstill. It's, it kind of intermingles with the normal operation and makes double duty use of the Unibus. Um, so what we should be seeing on the um, Unibus when this um, transfer takes place, when we try and run the test program, is we should see the NPR line go low, we should see the uh, NSYNC line go high, so master sync just uh, essentially means that um, the card is in control and something, in this case our interface, is the master of the uh, universe. And then in response to that it will put the address of its target uh, device on the uh, universe address lines, um, assert the M-Sync line, it then waits for the uh, S-Sync, slave sync line to respond, indicating that the target device has put the required data onto the uh, data bus and that line is also used to cancel the M-Sync from the master device that so kind of terminates the, uh, the bus cycle process and I suspect that's where the problem lies because the, um, the cycle is not completing so chances are it's failing somewhere along the way. Uh, so we'll look at the logic analyzer screen, we'll capture a cycle using this test program and uh, see how far it's getting. So on the analyzer, if we look at the trigger, I've got the trigger set for when the NPR line goes low. We'll try and capture some data and see what happens. So I'll now try and run the program. And we have captured something. Uh, I've got the logic analyzer in timing mode because we can't really use state mode um, because as soon as the processor has an issue, it halts and it stops the main CPU clock, the PDP clock, so we wouldn't get any more data. But we do in timing mode, of course. So looking at the data we've captured, you can see that it, it has um, got the value of 3000 and that's the target address. Uh, the next thing it does, and um, our trigger point is the vertical red line, so we see the NPR line going low and that is a request to the PDP CPU that the interface wants to use the bus and in response the bottom trace is the NPG, the non-processor grant and that is a response from the main CPU, the PDP CPU uh, meaning yes, go ahead, you may use the bus at the appropriate point in this cycle and that's an important thing, the, the appropriate point in the cycle is important, there are various timing constraints um, that a DMA device needs to adhere to. Uh, we then have, or what we should then see is at some point the uh, master sync line, which is the third line up, uh, going low. And so if we start scrolling across, so this is 200 nanoseconds per division, we're now three microseconds along, four, okay that's too long, it should by now, it should have yeah, there's nothing uh, going on there, so go back to zero. So, as we thought, the master sync line is never dropping, and that's why that we're getting a bus error. It's it's kind of freezing part way through this um, bus cycle. So, what we need to do is try and figure out why the um, master sync line never changes. We know that the fault is apparently not with the main PDP CPU, which makes a nice change. <laughs> 
um, because it is responding the way it's supposed to. The busy line is also doing what we'd expect in that it's, uh, stay, it's indicating that the bus is, uh, is occupied and the, um, the acknowledge line is also dropping in response to the NPR line going high. So the bus is apparently doing what it's supposed to but what's not happening is the, um, in this case the master device which is our interface card it is not going ahead with the process that it has requested and it's not um, lowering the master sync line. So uh, I'll move the camera back so you can see the console and we'll see if we can figure out what's going on. Unfortunately I can't get everything in shot. So the card we're working on is actually this one, you can just see the bottom edge of it. Um, but really it's the scope that we're interested in looking at and the schematics. So. I suspect um, the fault is somewhere here in the schematic. This is the uh, part of the uh, RX211 interface and we have the two devices. You may be able to see one at the bottom, it's the ones with the gold caps on and um, these are kind of fairly rare devices and they are used to, they're basically interrupt controllers and they're used to uh, control the generation of the uh, sync lines for the uh, uh, card when it uses the unibus. Um, but what we'll do is we'll look at the output of this. The master sync is generated through these components here. We'll start at the live end and it's this output here that we want to start with first. That's uh, ICE 64 pin 8. So I'll put the scope probe on this, we'll run the test program and see if that actually toggles. It should go low uh, towards the end of the test program. Okay, so you want me to see this, um, but I'm putting the scope probe onto pin 8 of that IC. It's currently high, and I'll try and run the program. Okay. So the error line's gone high again, but the line never went low, so I just need to reset the PDP. OK, so we know that the output, the M-Sync, is not going uh, low. We kind of knew that anyway from the logic analyzer. So what we'll do now is we'll follow this back through. So what we've got is a flip-flop that's used to effectively latch the M-Sync line until it's cleared. So we have this master sync clear and that will, when enabled, will clear this latch. So master sync should get set when master sync clear occurs in response to the uh, S sync line coming in somewhere else in the schematic or due to a reset. Uh, it will clear master sync uh, but it needs this line here to toggle to set it in the first place. So we'll check to make sure that the Busy out is enabled. It's pin 12, this is uh, still E64. So I'm just going to check pin 12 to make sure that the, um, the, the IC is enabled in the first place, which it is, so that's fine. So the next thing we need to check is uh, pin 11, that should change state um, at the or towards the end of our test program. So that's pin 11 of E64. So again, you can't see the ball. Okay, so I'm, I'm on pin 11. We'll try and run the program. Okay, so nothing. It's so going back to the schematic. Go back one more step. We have this 74123, and it's being used to generate a pulse of a certain width. Now, I mentioned that the timing is critical on the or fairly critical on, on the um, backplane uh, or the unibus when these transfers take place. It has to allow setup times etc for various things. And one of those is called DSQ and that's what uh, this is for. It's to introduce a short delay between the NPR master being asserted and the uh, uh, M-Sync line going low. So We'll check this next to make sure this pulse generator is working. We should see a short pulse on the output of this in response to NPR master changing state. And then we can go back and see if the uh, NPR master input is changing.
So the next one to look at is um, pin 11 of E64. We know it isn't changing state, so look at the input, it's pin 2 of E71. Let's reset the PDP. So I'm going to reach around the camera here, okay. And we'll try and run the test program. Okay, and that is changing state. Right, so what we know now is that the input to this 74123 is changing state, but the output never pulses. So it looks like this device is faulty. It should, when the input on pin 2 changes, we should get a short pulse on the output, but nothing's happening. So um, I suspect this uh, E71 is faulty. I'm just going to run a few more tests. If it does the same thing repeatedly, then I'm going to try replacing this device and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, I've replaced E71. I've reloaded the test program and we'll look back and see if we're now getting a pulse out of pin, uh, what pin was it? Pin four. And uh, if I will look at the where we looked before, so it's pin 11 of uh, E64. So E64. Okay, so I run the program. Okay, I don't know if you saw that, but there was a pulse uh, output on the scope. And uh, more importantly, if we look at the display on the console, it's stopped at uh, address 1206. And if you recall from the previous um, programs I've written, that's an indication that the test uh, succeeded. So it looks like it's actually gone a lot further this time and um, also notice that the error line is still low so um, there's no error being generated and it seems to be going successfully through the test so I'll move the camera up so you can see the logic analyzer screen again and we'll see what it's capturing now rerun the program it's captured some data and uh, same as before, we could see it's address 3000, it's putting 3000 onto the address bus. The NPR and NPG are doing what they're supposed to, but now notice... So notice here that the M-Sync line is dropping, that's the output from the RX211 interface card, and in response to that, um, the memory card is uh, asserting uh, sleep sync, so it's basically saying yes here's the data that you wanted and the address at that time is 3000 which is what it should be and um, although this uh, test program indicates that there should be 50 octal uh, bytes transferred that won't actually work because as soon as it gets to the end of this test program uh, the main PDP CPU clock uh, stops because there's a halt at the end of the program so it won't then transfer any more data. If you wanted to you could put a small loop at the end of the test program it would then continue to, uh, to transfer data but um, this is what I was trying to test for and it appears now to be doing what it should do. So as a final test what we'll try doing is loading um, another program into the PDP and we'll try writing data into the um, the buffer on the RX02 and reading it back and see if it can manage to successfully transfer data to and from the PDP RAM. I now have two test programs loaded, one at uh, address 1000 which should transfer one word of data from the PDP uh, RAM into the RAM in the RX02, that's the buffer and then the second program loaded at address 2000 should do the reverse. You should take the data from the uh, buffer memory in the RX02 and transfer that back to the uh, RAM in the PDP. It's using DNA, so it's using exactly the same mechanism that it would normally use in normal operations. So, so we'll begin by putting some data into address 3000. That's the target address I've got set in the program. We examine that, it's currently got the default in when I boot it up. We clear that and we'll put a value of 25 in there. Just arbitrary values, it doesn't really matter, just as long as we can tell that apart from the 
a default data. And um, if we check that, address 3000, and what's there if we examine is 25. We'll now run the first program, which should transfer that data into the RX02 buffer RAM. Run the program, and it has uh, successfully terminated. It's stopped at the correct address. We haven't got an error. And also, you can't see it on the scope. Uh, the error line is still low. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll clear the... That value 25 should now be in the buffer in the RX02. We'll go back to address 3000. I'll clear this now and um, let's check. So address 3000, examine is now zero. The next thing we'll do is go to the second program, which is at address 2000. And this should now do the reverse. It should take the data that's stored in the RX02 buffer, use DMA and transfer that back into the PDP RAM. So we'll try running this. And again, it's terminated correctly. We'll go back to address 3000. Examine this, should now be 25. And it is indeed 25. So it appears to be running it's, it, uh, in as much as it can transfer data using DMA between the PDP and the RX02 buffer and from the RX02 buffer back to the PDP. The error line has stayed low in both uh, tests and I should also now be able to restart the PDP uh, successfully. Before it wouldn't restart, I had to power cycle it and it has indeed restarted, so that's a good sign. The last thing I'm going to do in this video is try and boot from floppy disk. Now, I don't think it's going to boot because I only have one 16K uh, RAM card fitted and although I do have a 128k card it doesn't work if I try and do these tests with it it uh, stops it might be a configuration problem there are some dip switches on there that I don't know what they're for um, but if I try and boot using that card although that card passes all the memory tests um, it won't boot so I suspect it's a configuration issue so the boot disk I have, I don't really know what the image is that's on there. I think it's an RT11 boot image and uh, it's, uh, the disk is written in double density, which I can now read. That was one of the faults that was caused by the open circuit wires. It, won it will now read double density and single density disks. Um, but I don't think it's going to boot up successfully because I, I don't think 16K is uh, enough RAM for at RT11 to boot up, but we'll give it a go and uh, see what happens. So I'll put a disk into the floppy drive. Okay, I've got a disk in the floppy drive and rather than changing the jumpers on the uh, bootloader, what I'm going to do is try and run directly from the entry point of the bootloader uh, prom on the uh, bootloader card. So I'll just enter the address for that, that's 773004. And we'll try and run this and see what happens. So fingers crossed. Okay, well, not surprisingly it hasn't booted, but I don't think it's because it's faulty. I think it's just insufficient RAM we have. And uh, I think what's most likely happening here is uh, we're just running out of RAM during the uh, boot process. So, um, We'll also try starting the, um, the code from address zero. That's kind of where the control is handed to after the boot process and see what happens. And we're getting exactly the same address. So it does look like that's what's happening. It's going through the boot process, handing control to the um, PDP start address at zero. And then it's failing because um, part of the code is missing, but effectively, uh, not loading the entire uh, boot. Uh, also, the driver's doing more interesting things during that process, so I'll move the camera across and you can have a look and see what it now does in response to a boot request. Okay, so you probably can't see too much, but you're looking down in the sort of bowels of the system there, you should see the head uh, starting, or at least the back end of the head carrier moving and instead of going once and then resetting like it did before you should see it going through several sectors. So I'll try and run it now. Okay, so hopefully you could see it was actually going through and uh, reading several sectors. 
and um, that's kind of what you'd expect to see during a normal boot cycle so I'll move the camera back okay so we've made some good progress the system I believe is now capable of booting from floppy disk I just need more RAM so it's just a couple of failed ICs and some open circuit tracks on the RX02 control board um, I think the reason it won't boot now is just lack of RAM and so the next thing I need to look at is getting this RAM card working it does pass all RAM tests uh, it just won't boot up if I try and put this in in place and um, run the test program it uh, fails um, there's also an awful lot of glue logic on this for a RAM card so I suspect that some of these switches um, enable or disable various functions within the card but I don't know what those are some will be to set the base address of course uh, or capacity and uh, it's these top ones I suspect are for setting some more uh, in-depth control features if you've got any information on this card then uh, please let me know this is the only information that's marked on here uh, but that is the next step and I think once I have enough RAM fitted to this machine um, it may well boot from floppy disk